and on a, a hold it to um, you know, 20 minutes. Like 20 minutes. Um, I just want to welcome all of you to Hopland and to Mendocino County as well. I, um, it's been my home for about 58 years, so I've been around a little while. <clears throat> I just want to say how humbled I was um, at this opportunity here to speak to all of you. Um, let's say a very sophisticated group. Um, I was one of those guys that dropped out of high school after the, I mean, out of college after the first semester. And I came home to build a winery and make wine with no formal education or no experience as far as that goes either. So at first I thought I didn't have any, any right to be here, here, um, here today speaking. But then I thought too, along the way, I learned a lot of hard lessons through the school of hard knocks over the years as we began. So I kind of thought perhaps some of them may have, have, have a bearing on some of your talks here this weekend. I'm the eldest of 11 children in the Fetzer family. Our father was in the lumber business his whole life here in Mendocino County. Um, but his passion uh, was wine and farming. Um, our mother was really happy. She had a, a comfortable new home in Ukiah, but our dad had a young growing family, um, actually a big family, what it en ended up to be. His concern, I think, was raising a bunch of children in town. And one Saturday, uh, my brother and I uh, were laying on the floor uh, watching some you know, a Popeye movie or some movie like that. And my dad walked through the in front of the house. He hated TV. He picked up a chair, threw it through the TV set, and said, get the hell out of the house. <laughs> well, about a year and a half later, we found ourselves on this old farm. He searched around for about a year and a half. He found this old, this old rundown property called the Smith Ranch. The Smith Ranch had been abandoned for about five years. The, um, all the vineyards were hardly worthy of another uh, pruning or cultivation. Um, the old Civil War house that was on the property, all the bats and the owls had moved into chimneys. The attics were full of rats. So my dad and I worked for a year on the house before our mom moved out there. But it was a cool piece of property the naysayers in the community, uh, my father's friends and co-workers would say, hey, Barney, you're a fool to buy this property. Um, it has a history of no water. You have a growing young family. Uh, you shouldn't do it. And he was an accountant at a sawmill at that time. But our dad had a dream. He had that passion, and he had that can-do approach. I mean, he really did all through his life. And I think I picked that passion up from him, too, in that can-do approach. Our father was an interesting guy. He would have loved the email that we have today. He communicated with me by memos. Uh, he was gone a lot, so he would make these great big lists. And um, as he would travel to the East Coast and the West Coast, he would say, John, I want you up in the office early so I can call you at 4 or 4.30 before I go to work. So I'd be at the office at 4, 4.30 in the morning waiting for his call, which seldom ever happened. He may be called about 5% of the time, but I learned to get up early at a very early age. Our TV set that he broke in the house, he had to buy a new one, but when he bought the ranch, he traded the TV for an arc welder. So we did not have a clue what was going on for 10 years in the TV world but we all learned how to weld very well. Um, he bought this ranch for 50,000. It doesn't sound like a lot of, an awful lot. It had 1,000 acres. It had rivers and streams, mountains. It had um, old barns and equipment. And for us kids, it was like being in Disneyland. It was just at a great time. But also what it really, taught us, I think, as we grew up. Um, we didn't have a lot of money after we bought the ranch. We, um, 
um, ate crab apples, our mom made homemade bread, we um, made our own ice cream, we ate venison about 100% of the time, venison, venison, venison. But what it really taught us, I think, is how to live off the land and I think how to respect the land. And uh, back in the early 50s and 60s, uh, most of the farmers up in this area were all um, either German or Italian farmers who were really farming organically but didn't really call it organic farming. So we had the opportunity to have these guys be our mentors. So they taught us how to prune, how to care for the vineyards, how to repair the equipment. So I think we really learned, let's say, the good feel of the land through these older, older gentlemen that really taught us everything we knew. So when I, I dropped out of college and I came home, um, it was 1967, did not have a lot of money. And I think what um, we inherited from my father uh, was that dream. You have to have a dream. You got to have that passion. And you got to have that can-do spirit. You got to, it has to be in your belly. So what we did, um, took an old barn. We kicked the horses out of the barn and began making wine in this little old dirty barn. And what we did since we didn't have the capital or the cash flow to really go out and hire a contractor, is that I began building without any experience in construction, design, or architecture. Um, so we just began. We just started doing it and spent a lot of time rummaging around the old junkyards at the sawmills where our father worked at. I'd bring home discarded electric motors bring back conveyors, bring back any kind of building material that we could use for the winery. Um, also, we pulled the, all the gravel and the, river, and the sand out of the river to mix cement for the slabs on the first phase of the winery. We, and um, here again, did not have, have the capital to buy a rebar for the concrete, so we put old bicycle parts, box string, and mattresses, and you can go back today, 45 years later, the concretes have no cracks in them. We also removed rock from the rivers to build rock walls. Um, that winter, we found out that God put the rocks in the rivers for a reason. <laughs> we figured out very quick it had lowered our river by about a foot and a half into the blue clay. So we spent the next summer putting rock back in the river. <laughs> and it took about six or seven years before the crawdads returned. So sometimes by just doing, there are consequences you got to uh, face, and just as long as you don't make that mistake twice. Um, um, our father passed away in 1981 uh, suddenly. And again, the naysayers were on the bleacher saying, hey, these hippie kids are not going to be able to run this winery. Um, in the early 80s, we had long hair, and we were kind of a wild, snarly-looking bunch, I think. And um, so everybody was saying, these your kids are not going to be able to run this winery. So over overnight, I was actually put into position here to run this winery at a very young age of about 34 with my siblings. We owed the bank a lot of money, so I immediately cut my hair, uh, bought a cheap suit, and jumped in the car and went to San Francisco to plead with the bankers to give us some rope, give us um, time to prove that we can actually run this winery and even grow it. Um, when our father passed away in in boxes, we were doing about 130,000 um, at that time when he passed away. Well, by really focusing on quality, and and uh, we had our own marketing and sales operation as well, which was um, from a winery like our our size uh, um, it was unique. But we grew Fetzer over eight and a half years, up to about the eighth largest winery here in the country over two and a half million cases of wine. 
And so I guess what I want to say is that if you have that, that dedication and that, and that passion, it can really, really happen. And it happened you know, for our family. But I think that um, um, you know, by just trying new ideas and new concepts that other people have not done, and there's always people out there that are going to say it's not going to work, but I just think you have to have that in your belly, um, you know, that gumption just to keep going. Um, all of us worked in the winery. Um, all of us grew up in the winery, except for one sister who was our biggest consumer. So she helped on that double-digit growth every year. <laughs> and so she was, a, she was a major factor. Also in the early 80s, and what was happening, we had a lot of change in our industry. You know, um, the 50s and 60s, the old farmers were farming these head pruned vines that you could drive a tractor um, down the row and across the row to get rid of the weeds. What had happened in the 80s, we were learning to produce more um, per acre and we're putting them on trellises. So get the vines up higher, open them up, we could increase our tonnage by about four tons per acre, sometimes picking eight tons per acre or more. But what happened is that when you can't cross cultivate, the weeds are growing up under the trellis. So in the 80s, the chemical companies had good sales forces and good also marketing companies. So they came to the rescue of the farmer saying that you can farm cheaper by putting herbicides and pesticides in the vineyards. So we bought into it. We said, great, this will make it a lot faster, make it a lot easier. So we got out of the organic aspect of it um, in, the, in the early 80s, only to find out after a couple of years what was happening. The cover crops that used to be this high, nice and green, and lush with butterflies and bees had gone away. Um, and the cover crops were this high, uh, they were yellow, and the vines seemed to be affected as well. So we always kept the bank um, abreast of what all of our plans were. And so I went to the bank and I said, we're gonna convert the vineyards back over to organics. At that time, we were farming about 1,800 acres of grapes here in the Hopland area. The bank looked at me, and I know what they were thinking, that we were smoking something up here. Because they had a look of fear on their face that, um, um, that actually we could lose everything if we transition here back in. It takes a lot more equipment, it takes more knowledge, and more personnel. So again, um, having somebody say that you can't do it. You know, we just hunkered down and said, we're going to do it. We're going to prove it. So against the wishes of the bank, we went back home, and my brothers and I and my sister said, we're going to do it. Well, in about a year and a half, we had transitioned all the 800 acres, or 1,800 acres, back to organics. The ranches came alive, <clears throat> and we began to plant a lot of habitat areas several acres of habitats on each ranch. So I think, again, um, if you're running any kind of a business, you're going to run into roadblocks and um, you know, people that say that it, it can't be done, but it can always be done. Another thing that we did at Fetzer is um, in the early 80s, uh, people were making Chardonnay aged in oak. Well, it cost a lot of money. We didn't have the capital or the cash flow to buy the oak barrels. And we're trying to look at the carbon footprint on what we're doing too as we grew Fetzer. So we thought, instead of putting the Chardonnay grapes or juice in barrels, let's just bottle a nice clean Chardonnay, uh, crisp and clean and fruity without having to cut trees down to make barrels. And we did, and again, um, you know, people were saying, oh, you can't do that, it hasn't been done. Well, we grew the Sundial Chardonnay, the largest single-selling brand in the country, over a million cases in about eight, about eight years. So again, um, I just want to emphasize, you know, um, you, know just, you just have to do it. Seriously. 
And something else that we did too is that, is that we really felt there was not one of us that had a college education. So we thought we need to hire people that are smarter than we are. So we did. Every salesperson, marketing person, they had degrees. But, but I think we were the captain of the ship and we had the roadmap. So we could kind of, you know, kind of have them follow us. And we built a great family um, over the years in, in the Fetzer organization. So I think desperation, I think, breeds opportunity. And I just think it's so infectious, I and mean, I really do. We sold Fetzer in 92, uh, which had become a household brand at that time. Um, and we had an eight-year non-compete, so we all uh, kind of settled into a life of a gentleman farmer, my brothers and sisters and I. Uh, when we sold the winery, we sold one winery, kept the other one, and kept all the properties. So I worked for about six years separating all the properties from my siblings and got bored. Uh, we, um, all we could do is actually plant vineyards and some other projects, but um, after about four years, we got, we got bored, and, uh, and my wife Patty and I decided to start a brand called Saracena, which was a small one. You know, Fetzer grew quite large, and it was like crushing gravel. The trucks were lined up, and the same thing all day long. So at Saracena, we wanted to really, um, and it began as a dream and a passion, and that can-do approach. We were going to change our approach with Saracena. We wanted to have a more farm-friendly feel, so when people come onto the property, it does not have that corporate vineyard look like a lot of vineyards do. So what we wanted to do is remove vineyards. We had deer fences out front. We put all the deer fences in the back so they had their own habitat. Also planted a lot of olive uh, trees, so we produce our own oil now. We have um, a lot of bees on the property. We're doing our own bees. And what we found out with the bees is that we have them in several locations. We found out this last year that, that having your vineyards um, in an organic situation or biodynamic, we plant cover crops every spring or every winter, so in the spring they're full of flowers. The bees that are around the cover crops we found produce like about three times more. The honey is more, it's a lighter, a prettier honey. So it's really been fun to see how you can manipulate in a good way, um, you know, insects and, um, and these little creatures. Um, we also wanted to construct our buildings in a different manner. At Fetzer, we filled in a whole big valley with buildings, not very attractive. So having a second chance on it, we thought we want to you know, limit the carbon footprint on our property. We want to keep it more pristine, we keep it like a farm. So all the outbuildings that we build are 100% recycled material. So if I'm in the city, and I see somebody ripping a roof off. This was in San Francisco here, the old tile roof. I'll pull in there and swap them wine for the material. And I, I don't call my junkyards um, actually junkyards. I call them um, actually boneyards. So I got a huge several acres of, of junk that I do use. The only trouble with having a lot of junk, you have to create plans to keep building, which is, is fun for me. But we also, on our newer buildings, we kept in mind, um, you know, lighting, energy, and the carbon footprint, how the building is shaped and how it's faced. We also wanted to do something unique to our area, is build some caves. I talked to several people and they said, oh boy, that's going to be really tough. You're going to spend a half a million just um, you know, determining where it's going to go. And I said, the hell with that. So we just started digging into the side of the mountain, and it, and it, and it turned out beautiful. You know, I had no idea. I know people that will spend four or 500000 kind of getting the engineers out there and trying to figure it out. Well, we went into the side of the hillside where I thought we had a good opportunity, and 
um, about 30 feet in, it looked questionable. They had to kind of reinforce it. We got 35 feet, pure rock. But the or naysayers on this project was the county. It was the county planning, the county building, and the health department fought us for three years. Every, for every foot of rock we dug out of it, it was equally the same amount of work with the county. But eventually we uh, actually prevailed on that. But it took us about three years to build a cave. Uh, the cave, um, it's so important here to me because we can keep it at a constant 57 degrees. So we don't spend one cent on energy. I could have built the biggest, ugliest building out by the highway with uh, trailer offices and it would have sailed through the county in about three weeks. So it just shows you sometime again, you have to be persistent if you have that dream. You really gotta follow it through. Um, and also we're working on some wind generation to do the lights in the cave so we're able to be 100% off the grid, completely off the grid. Um, on the property here too, we wanted to um, have, have our, our weed eaters here, the goats, and our dream is to have our own goat cheese within a year and then also follow through on our dream to have our own prosciutto. We're planting wheat, we began last year, so we hope to kind of have some wheat fields in amongst the vineyards. Um, so again, it's, um, it's just finding that, um, or fine tuning your property. Something else that we're doing on the second time around is, um, is we're also using all native yeast in our fermentation. At Fetzer, we use cultured yeast, but during the fermentation, we're using um, all wild yeast in all of our fermentations. Uh, we're not filtering the wines. Every time you filter a wine, you strip it out. So we use either ice and glass, um, which is uh, some shells ground up for fining, or we use organic egg whites for the filtering of the red wine. So kind of doing things that, that we did not do at Fetzer. Um, and we're also looking at our packaging a lot closer the, here because to lessen our carbon footprint. Um, so we're using lighter glass, uh, less label on the, um, on, the, um, on the glass as well. And looking at, at other opportunities for lesser packaging even. Another project that we're really excited about that we just began last year is that we're working with a, a family that is the largest producer of clay pipes in this country. So we're kind of working closely with them and then um, a professor over in the Berkeley area in his class on amphora containers. So what we're doing is we like to ferment and age wine in, in clay containers. Um, here again, a lot of people say it can't be done. A lot of, in our industry, it's usually this, um, our metal tanks, the stainless, or the oak, uh, which are not as environmentally friendly. So here last year we began with the clay pipes or the, or the tanks and found out that the aromas were, uh, comparing them to the metal tanks or the oak tank was the best. Our winemakers felt that the clay was really good, but we had a little roadblock here is that we picked up a little pigment in the color of the Chardonnay. So again, we need to continue to keep working on this and to solve that problem, which I think we will this well, you know, here this year. So it, all these projects sometimes are not easy. So what I do every day is I get up, I review my project list, and I add to it. It's always eight or 10 pages long, never get shorter, and a backup file this thick. And what it does, it really motivates me to get up and get going every morning. So I would advise you to have an audacious project list, carry it with you, and when you meet someone as audacious as you, I join forces, I did with my wife. It's been a great adventure. So I'd leave you with um, 
some other obvious um, but important thoughts. I wouldn't overthink it or overdo it. And naysayers, I would not let them get in your way. I really wouldn't. I'd just continue to do, and you'll achieve your success as only you can define it. I promise you.